if you want to dedicate more of yourself to erudition, to being well read, if you want to find inspiration and energy and motivation to to go as deep as possible. And hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to do a good old fashioned bookshelf tour. We're going to do another shelf of nonfiction. I said in my most recent episode of reading the first 3000 penguins that you can watch those videos in any order. I jump around all over the place. Um, the same is uh, goes for the my bookshelf tours. And now without further ado, let's tackle this shelf. What would a bookshelf tour be without a good bit of shaky handwork? You know, I'll try to keep this as far from Blair Witch Project levels of shaking as possible, but I am prone to a bit of clumsy handwork. Um, always nice to uh, give a little overview of which bookcase we're working on. We are in the upstairs library. There are books all over this house. Yeah, last, last time we went through the books in that bottom shelf there. It was also non-fiction. And today we're going to tackle that bad boy. So let's go. Okay. First up is Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens. Now, this is a very, very well-known and widely read book. So I'm not going to say a huge amount about it. This shelf, um, as I said, is non-fiction, but as you can see, there's a bit of double stacking going on. So, um, yeah, I will try to linger on some books and maybe go a little quicker through others, maybe books that I have covered in other videos on my channel. So, yeah, Sapiens, this is a lovely hardcover edition. Um, although I first read this in a different version that I no longer have. It's this story of humankind and human development. There's some beautiful plates, color plates of um, hand painting. It's the famous uh, La Salle cave in France. Estimated to be 15 to 20,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? And here's another famous one uh, known as the Hands Cave, which was discovered in Argentina. I mean, it's really incredible and artistic, expressive. There's something very, very moving, I find, about this this one in particular. These hands reaching, reaching, you know, like coral swaying in the depths of time, reaching out, reaching up to catch a little bit of light. In another sense, they, they seem quite desperate and pleading. But it is a real immediacy, a real deep resonance. And sometimes these kind of popular, popularizing works of history that kind of synthesize and um, summarize very broadly are, are criticized or disparaged for, you know, just for being popular in a kind of a pejorative sense. But, you know, very niche and specific and uh, in-depth particularized history is, you know, it's not for everyone. I mean, I'm not so interested in how many pairs of underpants King Henry VIII had or what Charlemagne sprinkled his croissants with. But, of course, that's not what niche and specific um, specialized history is all about. I'm obviously being a little bit facetious there. Sometimes I do enjoy um, very uh, specific historical subjects, especially when it is biographical but uh yeah I'm, this this book really just you know goes all the way back to prehistorical times and um you know sort of the sweep of of geological time and and then he also is quite speculative and looking at ai and intelligent design but uh it's it's entertaining it's very thought-provoking and it's well written and i enjoyed it very much i'll just leave that out for now um Next is, an, is, a, is a book along similar lines, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs and Steel. Um, yeah, again, it's a, it's a popular 
history, short history of everybody for the last 13,000 years. Now, I haven't actually reread this in more than 10 years, so it's been quite a while since I last read it. But um, I really enjoyed this book. I think it does uh, an incredible job of dispelling sort of discriminatory and racist ideas of, you know, okay, well, like Africa is so underdeveloped and chaotic. Um, and Asia, obviously, parts of Asia are, are, are very underdeveloped. And, you know, Europe is so advanced and sophisticated and, and this kind of West versus East or global North versus global South mentality that is quite prevalent sort of, yeah, in um, popular culture and the popular in popular consciousness. He, he makes really interesting and compelling arguments against those myths, right? He talks about like, uh, whether he talks about geographical influence, right? Like to be on an east-west axis or to be on a north-south axis, for for example. So, you know, Europe is um, is is a is a landmass lying on an east-west axis axis, and that means that you can travel really, really, really far in either direction across Europe with unchanging climatic conditions. And so, you know, you can have Mediterranean climate you know, all the way across Southern Europe. And um, yeah, that means that you can transport um, food and plants, you know, fruit and vegetables, grains, uh, clothing, tools, house building techniques can spread really, really far across a, a, a continent that has an east-west access and still be very applicable. Whereas, um, when you go north and south, climate changes really, really uh, rapidly when you go north and south. So you can travel, you know, so early peoples might travel, you know, from the north of Africa down towards southern Africa. But like the climactic and environmental changes uh, and that also means flora and fauna and weather conditions and, um, you know, soil uh, types of soil and soil conditions, all of these things, um, rain patterns, seasonal conditions, all of these things are so very different. And so that allowed technology and domesticated foods, domesticated uh, plants and animals to spread really rapidly east-west um, and, and much more slowly in a north-south axis. Um, axis. Also, the sort of contingency of domesticable animals, right? So, um, even today, zebras, elephants, giraffes, you know, all of the, the animals that, you know, lions, uh, wildebeest, um, rhinoceros, all of these animals that naturally um, live and thrive in Africa um, are still to this day undomesticated. It's just in their genes, they have a kind of wild trigger in their brain that is just not tameable. Whereas, you know, just the sort of luck of the draw, the, the contingency of time and place that pigs, chickens, cows, goats, sheep, all of these animals, well, the ancestors of these animals um, were native to the Fertile Crescent so the sort of Middle East, um, as well as domesticable crops were also native to that region. And yeah, and so they were they spread very easily uh, west and also um, east. So those two factors um, were, were massive. And then, of course, the domestication of livestock of these animals like cows, chickens, pigs, etc. Um, of course, some of them also were native to the Far East, such as chickens and pigs, were, were Asian, of Asian origin. But again, you can travel all the way west from, from East Asia all the way into modern day Europe uh, along fairly unchanging um, latitude. So, yeah, and then, you know, around the time of the agricultural revolution, around 12,000 years ago, the first grains were domesticated, crops were domesticated, um, but then that allowed human groups to stop roving 
as hunter gatherers and actually uh, have surplus food, surplus grains that allowed them to settle, that allowed hierarchies of um, skill and property as well. Um, so those who controlled the food supply immediately, you know, accumulated wealth, which led to a whole lot of other problems. But also, uh, following quickly after the domestication of crops was the domestication of uh, of livestock, of cattle. And the living in close quarters with these domesticated animals uh, gave rise to a huge amount of disease and pestilence, right? The Black Plague, um, influenza, all of these diseases, many of them, argues Joe Diamond, came out of that close proximity um, between human settlements and uh, livestock. And um, then when the then when the uh, explorers, you know, out of Spain and Portugal and the Dutch and eventually the French and the English, when they traveled to the other parts of the world um, on their uh, missions of empire, uh, they brought those diseases with them to parts of the world in which animals were not so readily domesticated and there was less of that crowd-generated diseases. Um, and yeah, the peoples living in South America, in Africa, in, in the Far East or wherever these um, particular settlements were, uh, the, um, the indigenous people of America as well, um, they were very susceptible, they didn't have immunity. So that's where the, in this title, germs, that covers germs, um, but also guns and steel, you know, the, the, the settlement of communities, um, and the surplus of food supplies allowed um, people, certain members of the communities, to not have to always be working to produce food. And that quickly led to specialization um, and eventually writing developed as well as a way to keep track of the numbers of, of livestock and of, um, you know, quantities of grain. And that, you know, eventually a long way down the line played its part in the rise of, uh, you know, of the Enlightenment. So these things are all connected. And I think Diamond does a, a great job of, you know, uh, bringing this all, synthesizing all of the stuff into this very compelling and fascinating work of, of general popular history. Um, I do believe that some people have been highly critical of it. I'm not a historian or a scientist. So I, I don't um, have the historical acumen to critique this book, but I found it to be very enjoyable and compelling, and I think it's probably time for a reread very soon. But let's move along um, to another work of popular science. Uh, we have another very, very well-known book, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, from the Big Bang to Black Holes. Um, yeah. I won't say too much about this because it is, again, a very well-known book and I've, I've rambled at length covering these first two books. Um, it is very interesting, very heady with the, you know, the, the mathematics part of it, the sort of unfathomable scale of, you know, black holes and the, the size of the universe and all of these things. Um, at, at the end, I found it to be too abstract for a non-mathematician like myself. I uh, found the, the the last part of it to be um, a bit less enjoyable because I just couldn't quite really sort of um, immerse myself in the ideas uh, towards the end. My hand is getting pretty tired, um, so I might switch. Yeah. My hand is shaking like a, a 10 year old stepping into Disneyland for the first time and seeing SpongeBob in real life, although I don't think Spongebob is Disney, but, you know, seeing this gigantic Mickey Mouse and just shaking with absolute delight. That's how thrilled I am to be doing this bookshelf tour with you. But my hand is shaking from holding the camera at that angle. So I'm going to switch it up and I'm just going to reach for these books. And uh, so we had this, these one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Um, we're just stacked on top. Very untidily. Uh, first is Aldous Huxley, The Doors of Perception. Now I just talked about this book very recently in um, 
my penguin series because it's number 1351. So yeah, I won't say too much about it, except that um, in 1953, Aldous Huxley took some mescaline. Um, he was not at a, a rave or a festival. Uh, he was in a very domestic setting with his wife and with um, one of the scientists involved in, in researching psychoactive drugs. Um, and he um, takes this stuff and then sort of describes in, in very lucid detail uh, his experiences and the kind of glowing thingness of, of, of himself and the people around him, the objects around him. And um, yeah, like I said, I just talked about that rec the, this book recently. So I'll just say that this edition um, includes a sort of epilogue called Heaven and Hell, in which he um, delves into the history of mysticism. And uh, yeah, let's move swiftly along. Uh, Litten Strachey. This is a little um, excerpt, actually, of his book Eminent Victorians. Um, and that book actually, I believe, is in the first 3000 penguins. So I will get to it eventually. I don't have a copy of it. But this is a part of this is one chapter of that book on Florence Nightingale. And this is just a delightful little read. If you ever see this in a second hand bookshop, it'll probably cost like one dollar or one euro or one pound or whatever, wherever you come from. Um, and it's you know, it's better than any, um, you know, meal deal or McDonald's um, cheeseburger or wine gums or I don't know what else you can buy these days for for one dollar. But um, yeah, it's a delightful little read. Uh, we all know the name Florence Nightingale. We know that she was like this heroic nurse, but um, actually her story is incredible. She was born to an aristocratic family. And they just kind of wanted her to just marry and settle down to this dull, luxurious life. Well, dull. She, she, she found it to be dull. She found it to be superficial. Maybe some people would say it's not dull to be aristocratic. But um, nonetheless, she didn't want that. She wanted to be a nurse. She wanted to help sick people. And her family was really against it. But she just kind of just she had a real iron will and an incredible amount of energy and work ethic and she refused to give in and eventually they just out of I think exhaustion just relented and she took her chance uh, and went to the Crimea and yeah I mean we don't know we don't hear anything in the popular sort of culture or imagination these days about the Crimean war but it was awful it was a horrendous war so many innocent lives were lost and it was so poorly managed by the powers that be in Britain. They were just sealed up in their, you know, wood paneled offices, smoking cigars and dishing out orders. And they were, you know, they were sending so many young men to their graves. She went over there and she basically just took control of this whole hospital but it was a horrendous hospital it was in a terrible state there was no hygiene there was no fresh water there was almost nothing to eat there was just a abominable stink of rotting flesh and sick and dying men and chaos absolute chaos and she came in there and she basically worked 20 22 hours a day sleeping a couple of hours in her office and just gradually gained control of every detail of this hospital and and it was so hard i mean she um had so much opposition that the, you know the men that were running this place didn't want to give her the reins they were full of pride and they were like this young upstart woman like who does she think she is to come in here and tell us what to do but i mean luckily at least a few of them realized like hey i need to put aside my pride and my prejudices and she knows what she's doing and people's lives depend on it and she then tried to get more funding from the war office and they of course were obstinate and refused to acknowledge the the truth of what was going on <sighs> bloody hell it was it was awful but she persisted i mean what a testament to to 
to determination and to doing the right thing and to giving oneself to a good cause and for the betterment of, of humankind, she absolutely just, yeah, she gave every drop of her energy to helping the world to have less suffering. Lytton Strachey, he um, just basically doesn't get in the way of her personality and her story. I think that's key with the biography of, of such a huge, larger than life figure uh, is, you know, don't make this about you. Sometimes, you know, I've read certain biographies. I'll talk about one of them on my channel one day. There's a, there's a kind of book on, on Salinger that I read uh, in which the, the editor of this uh, volume uh, starts off the introduction and you're like, it, it's some, within the first couple of paragraphs, he's like, and here's where I come in. And you just groan, you're like, I'm not interested in, in you. I really want to know about Salinger. He was very um, private. He was a recluse. I'll, I'll get to that at some point. Lytton Strachey does not get in the way of Florence Nightingale. He does not say, and here's where I come in, and I knew her niece or, you know, whatever. Like, it's just, no, um, he really lets her shine through in his unobtrusive prose. But he's also funny. He's also witty. Um, he has a charming sparkle to his prose, but it's not about him. It's It's really about his subject. And in this case, it's Florence Nightingale, highly recommend this and I look forward to discussing eminent Victorians uh, on my channel at some point. Right, uh, next we've got Susan Sontag, Against Interpretation and other essays in this Penguin Modern Classics. This is um, one of my favorite books and it just narrowly did not make the cut when I was um, in, in, in a, my recent video where I talked about my top 10 favorite Penguin Classics. Um, didn't really deserve to not make the cut but I just had to narrow it down and I couldn't really pick and choose and it worked out I guess because now I'm I've got a chance to discuss it here this is a phenomenal book she published this book when she when when Sontag was around 30 is young and suave Sontag oh, the cover's a bit damaged it looks like she's chewing on a cigarette but that's just uh, a bit of damaged on the cover wow if you want to motivate yourself to read more if you want to dedicate more of yourself to erudition to being well read to watching the classic films uh, of the last hundred years if you want to um, find inspiration and energy and motivation to to go as deep as possible into this Thing, literature that we love um, but you're lacking the gumption or you're lacking the energy or you're feeling a bit um, like you need a bit of a caffeinated blast to the senses then this is a very inspiring book because like I said she was 30 around 30 when she published this and she had read everything and it's it's not I got this um, in uh, Shakespeare and Company in Paris. Uh, so happy, happy me memory from my, my days in Paris a few years ago. Um, but yeah, she covers a lot of ground and she, you can just feel the, the kind of deep knowledge um, glowing from these pages. I think she once said that like, Concentration is the easiest thing in the world for her. Like she can just concentrate on something complex for six hours at a time or something. So, you know, when I say that this book is inspiring, we should also be careful not to um, try and um, be Susan Sontag because, yeah, she was really a, a genius of criticism. Her fiction is, is, is not as good. I'm trying to get my grubby fingers onto the table of contents. There we go. Yeah, so Against Interpretation is the, the title essay on style. She's got uh, an essay on Camus' notebooks. She's got an essay on Georges Lukacs, Sartre, Inesco, um, on 
film and theater. She's got quite a lot. Gada, of course, Notes on Camp, very famous essay um, that I actually have here in the Penguin Mini. I was just going to say that. And yeah, it's just, um, yeah, really, really impressive and enriching and um, compelling. Yeah. And then the last one that was just on top there, as I said, um, on top of the row of books is Notes on Camp by Basantag in the mini. I think it's two essays. Yeah, Notes on Camp and One Culture and the New Sensibility. Um, she talks about camp as this sort of aesthetic principle, I suppose, um, in which one has this kind of carefree embracing of kitsch, uh, embracing of the garish, the over-the-top, the, top, the um, brightly colored. Um, it's this kind of, I suppose, rebuke of somberness and heaviness and, you know, sort of overly serious gray-haired eminence. It's this kind of um, uh, joie de vivre approach to art and life in which flamboyancy and extravagance and um, unfettered expressivity are highly desirous. And um, if, you, if you're thinking of diving into Sontag's Against Interpretation, then this is like a little teaser because it's excerpted from this work. Okay, I need to, I need to pick up the pace here. I'm gonna just grab a chunk from the shelf and Let's see, we've got more criticism here. We've got the fun stuff and other essays by James Wood. Well, talking about well-read writers, well-read critics, James Wood as well is just, um, yeah, extremely impressive in his, in his depth and range of reading. Um, this is a nice mix um, of classics that he has essays on here um, that he critiques. So he's got an essay on War and Peace. Thomas Hardy um, on the King James Bible and new translations of it. Um, but then he also has essays on contemporary writers. So Alan Hollinghurst, Ben Lerner, um, Ismail Kader, uh, Laszlo Krasna Hawkeye, Paul Auster. This, this essay is called Paul Auster's Shallowness. He's quite critical of Auster and if you love literature and you, you enjoy criticism, you know, I, I would say that criticism is, is a fast track to becoming a, a better reader and um, it's, uh, it really helps you to make connections between various voices uh, within the, the, the literary tradition. Yeah, you can, come out of, you can come out of a good work of literary criticism with a big reading list and a sort of a more sort of clarified network of, of intertextual connections. I've got more James Wood, uh, How Fiction Works. Yeah, this book um, I found to be less uh, enthralling than the fun stuff. I think because the title is a bit of a misnomer, How Fiction Works, it almost sounds like a book of, on craft, on, um, on sort of like how to write fiction. And it's not actually that really. It is more, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a critical um, approach to different aspects and elements of fiction. Uh, it is very good though, it is, it is very enjoyable. So talking about the rise of free and direct style in which narration is kind of slipping in and out of the character's conscious thoughts um, without clear boundaries of interiority and exteriority um, and, and lots of other things on dialogue and um, character detail, you know, flat characters versus round characters to use E.M. Forster's uh, terms, which, which uh, James Wood uh, mentions. Okay, we've got more literary criticism. This is a bit of a looser and sl more slanted and more idiosyncratic kind of criticism. This is How Literature Saved My Life by David Shields. Found it very st stimulating, uh, very thought provoking. He has a big interest in genre bending forms. So sort of 
books or artworks that blend fiction and memoir um, or reportage and fiction or you know mixed media multimedia um, in works of criticism that are also uh, very personal and particular and you know filled with all kinds of conjunctions and disjunctions i found them to be a bit hyper a bit sort of obsessive a bit fastidious he admits to that really he is a bit self-deprecating but still he sort of comes across um as maybe a bit of a know-it-all yeah it's a kind of riotous rumble through uh, a particular person's intellectual development, the emergence of their sensibility, their style, their voice. How to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. Yeah, this... Uh, Foster did also try sometimes to, to be funny and sometimes it felt like he was trying a bit hard. Uh, you know, sometimes a bit of a dad joke aspect to his quips. But... Overall, um, it, was, it was a good book, and, but if you always wanted to study literature and you just haven't had the chance for whatever reason, um, yeah, How to Read Literature Like a Professor is, um, is, is quite a nice guide to different elements and keys um, through which to unlock the, the meaning of a text and to interpret uh, a work of literature. And he talks quite a lot about the kind of parallels of um, our inherited mythology, our deep Western digestion of biblical mythology and ancient Greek mythology and how those stories are these kind of blueprints upon which all modern quests and stories and, uh, you know, the rise and fall of, of one's fortunes or a particular character's journey, they're always kind of somehow... Um, hinting at um, or echoing these very deep and ancient stories and sort of codes of narration and of character and uh, yeah it's you know I just enjoy this the, these kind of books I've you know I've read quite a, a few of them but um, I think that if you want to go as deep as possible into something that you're interested in it's not it's also good to, to go back to the basics and to go over um, surveys and introductory stuff and to kind of um, sharpen and refine. And you can argue against um, if you've read all of the primary texts that he d discusses, all of the, the kind of, you know, classics, you are then in a position to enter into a kind of dialogue with him. So, yeah, I enjoyed that one. I need to speed up here. I'm, I'm, I'm really waffling. Um, Okay, Etty Hillesum, An Interrupted Life and Letters from Westerbork. Etty Hillesum was a, a, a Jewish Dutch woman living around the time of World War II and um, she died in Auschwitz. And um, yeah, this is a, a beautiful and tragic record of her life, uh, her daily activities, her fears and hopes and frustrations. She was a, a person of immense positivity and hopefulness. She always found uh, something to be thrilled by and excited by and she had a deep hunger to learn and grow and she was quite into esoteric uh, philosophy and mysticism and all kinds of different and quite sort of groundbreaking fields, especially for that time. She was 29 when she, uh, when she died. And, uh, but yeah, her, even though she has not left behind very much in the way of writing, some uh, black and white family, uh, family portraits, even though she didn't leave behind like really polished works, there's a, a raw power to her diaries and her letters. And um, she has actually had quite a, a big influence on, um, well, on, on Dutch literary culture and also um, more widely on, yeah, kind of esoteric philosophy. So yeah, it's, a, it's a very, very heartbreaking, but beautiful um, collection of uh, an individual person's thoughts. Okay, I've got two Proust books here. I've got 
Days of Reading by Proust himself. This is a part of the Penguin Great Ideas series, number 53, that lovely green cover. And this is, yeah, Proust. It's kind of excerpts from different bits and pieces um, in which Proust uh, describes um, his, his love of literature and um, the sort of impact it had on his formative years and periods of loneliness and periods of ill health and how yeah, it shaped him uh, immensely and uh, some, some surprising influences. He loved Ruskin. Ruskin was a, a sort of an art critic. Uh, he wrote a lot about classical architecture and um, but he had a very beautiful musical and vivid prose style and that was an influence on on Proust so then I have another book on Proust by Alain de Botton how Proust can change your life um, it's quite a fun book quite uh, humorous mirthful look at the the way in which he sort of visually shows the incredible length of some of Proust's sentences in A Search for Lost Time. Um, and yeah, it's a typical uh, de Botton um, taking, you know, very um, sort of high art, high literature, high philosophy and making it into a bit of pop philosophy. Again, that often the term is often um, used in a kind of negative sense. But, you know, I read this book when I was just getting into literature and I think um, I was not ready for deep and heavy philosophy and Alain de Botton was a gateway for me into more complex and more challenging thinking and books and ideas. So um, yeah, it's a fun, fun book and it'll definitely get you excited about Proust, who, will, who we will be talking more about on this channel in due course. And I've got Khalil Gibran, the prophet. Um, I've actually been rereading bits and pieces of this. I was at the time not so impressed by it. I thought, oh, it's, it's a bit of like a kind of proto self-help book. It's absolutely not that. There is some, there is some real deep, soulful wisdom in here about, you know, how to treat your family and your neighbors, how to be kind and generous, how to love without seeking possession of the beloved um, and yeah you know as I get older I'm just like a little bit less snotty about ideas needing to be racy and highfalutin you know I, I also just appreciate experience and um, writing and ideas that come out of experience and that are grounded in empathy and in being kind and giving people a chance and not writing people off or cancelling people based on um, discrepancies in the way that you see the world or that, you know, the, the, the way that they express themselves. Um, we just can't build a better world if we just build walls. We, we need to build bridges. And I think a book like The Prophet um, is just like general life philosophy. Like it just encourages you to to be more open-minded to be more kind to be more patient and i think we, we just need more of that in the world so yeah it's been interesting revisiting this recently then i've got uh, greta thunberg no one is too small to make a difference now i wonder if somehow this wiggles through the algorithm and i get like greta thunberg haters you know um dropping bombs in the comments i don't know if that would happen but um I don't see why people get so inflamed about her. I suppose she is this like generational figure for just a different way of seeing the world. Some people don't seem to care about the environment. Some do. I'm not going to wade into a whole thing on Greta Thunberg. I think this book is, well, I think by sort of summarizing this book, I will maybe say in some sense what I think about her. I, I don't think that advocating for better environmental policies is a bad thing at all. I think obviously we are destroying the world. Obviously we need better environmental policies. But maybe this book is representative of the more rational critiques of her. So I'm, there are people that are just horrid and, you know, monstrous and they just like attack her because I think they're scared to see her young and powerful 
uh, girl or young woman now. Um, but I think that the, 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 the more fair and honest uh, critiques of her are more along the lines of like this, you know, tiny book um, being published. She seems to have um, all the right connections. She's given talks in houses of parliament. There's nothing wrong with that, but um, you know, she has this probably mega publishing deal, but um, maybe that mega publishing deal could have gone to somebody with more actual experience and expertise about environmental concerns because it's very surfacey, it's very one-dimensional, and um, yeah, I suppose if it if if this book encourages people to be more conscious of their carbon footprint then then it's, it's it's not a bad thing but yeah there seems to be a huge amount of resources channeled towards her as a kind of figure um and yeah i don't know i don't feel like extremely uh, triggered by her and i also don't think that she's like um a sort of mini swedish jesus that's come to you know save uh, the planet so i'm, I'm kind of agnostic about her as a figure but i thought the best way to have some perspective on this greta, Thun greta thunberg question is to actually um well read her words so that's what i did next is on contemporary art by caesar ira this is uh yeah an interesting sort of monograph on perspective and how he argues that contemporary art is so complex and transitory and experiential and sort of corporeal like a lot of contemporary art you have to like walk through it or be sort of immersed in it or surrounded by it with sounds and you know multi-sensory elements and he argues that the sort of reproducibility of art has driven contemporary art in this direction in which because images are so easily reproducible online uh, that that is, you know, obviously has a sort of reductive uh, effect and that the forefront then of art lies in ways which are as of yet not so easily reproducible. Um, so, yeah, I enjoyed that. This was published by David Zwerner Books and uh, it's a sort of part of a series on ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is... Um, of taking an experience of art and transferring it into another medium um, and yeah I always like to shout out um, smaller publishers to David Swerner books they really have this beautiful look at a beautiful color and as Nate from Nate's world would say it's got a good flop to it it's got a good floppiness um, this one was translated by Catherine Silver you know what I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to split this in two this is like Super long.